All right, let me know when I'm live. I turn off my ringer on my phone. <clears throat> turn the ringer off my family. Am I late? Oh, <laughs> thanks, Nancy. That's awesome. Uh, <clears throat> ah, there we go. All right. So that's hilarious. Um, someone asked about whether we could get a volcanologist on the on the live QA, and I said uh, no problem. I know a few volcanologists, and actually Nancy Grazino said make a note about volcanologists. Nancy is um, one of the good folks at the Weekly Space Hangout crew, and they of course are the really the executive producers of of a lot of the shows that we do, and they they kind of book our guests. So. Uh, I don't have a lot of control over the guests. I really just show up and, and hang out with whoever has been surprisingly booked to hang out with. Although I've, I've taken a little bit of, of charge with the, this Monday thing, but, uh, uh, but thanks Nancy. And, and if you like, if you want to have me talk to somebody, the best way to make that happen is to join the weekly space hangout crew. They will give you your executive producer, qualifications and then you can invite the person that you want and then they'll come on to the show and I will interview them and it's so I can't be everywhere and do everything at all the time so so the fact that the good folks at the WSH crew um, have organized themselves to do this is awesome and I I highly recommend it it's a it's super fun a great community so I'm sure there it is so go to WSH crew dot space and uh, and they will uh, join you up Julian Martin, you have terrible eye rings. I'm sorry. I'm a fat old man. So, you know, uh, and like bleached from the, or parched from the sun. So that's what happens when you get old. 46, almost 47. Uh, so let's get into, uh, for, before we get started, I want to show you guys something. Uh, check this out. So, you know, we're working on a book. Take a look. Let me see if I can make this happen here. So we've got the the proofs back and we're just going through them now. Um, and I just wanted to show you. Let's see if this is gonna work. For the Universe Today's Guide to Viewing the Cosmos. Now I can't show you much because it's still in editing form, but I wanna just sort of show you what it kind of looks like. So check this out. Uh, so this is the book and we're sort of in the process of putting it together. So Dave, Dickinson is editing it. I'm editing it. And we're aiming for a release sometime in October, thanks to Page Street, Pub Page Street Publishing. Uh, all right. Okay, so let's go. Uh, let's get on to some of your questions. And I know that everyone wants to talk about Space Force. Space Force! So um, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, although I don't really know much, right? So, uh, so today, well, so I did an episode about Space Force, about the militarization of space a couple of weeks ago. And um, the funny thing is that I sort of, I, I think I didn't predict, but in the video I said that Trump was, um, was trolling the media when he was saying that there was going to be a Space Force. And that was hilarious. And I was like, because he really looked like he was just having fun with the media. But he's mentioned it enough times now that I think he's, you know, he was pretty serious. And then today, uh, he did a press conference and announced again Space Force and that it's going to be a sixth, completely separate branch of the military. Um, they're going to separate out the space parts from the Air Force and make a Space Force. <sighs> I, whatever, right? Why not? Why not have a Space Force? Um, or don't have a Space Force? I mean, the thing is that right now, what is a Space Force? Space Force is you, uh, you send reconnaissance spacecraft up into space and they look back at the Earth. So that's the National Reconnaissance Office. You have uh, satellites that provide communication, logistics, uh, navigation, right? And that's provided again by the by the uh, the Air Force. You have 
um, sort of the detection of various kinds of space military uh, gadgets, uh, enemy weaponry, things like that. So again, that's sort of an Air Force thing. But the thing is, is that right now there isn't like rockets launching with space marines on board who are going to be battling on the surface of alien worlds with their dog fighting space fighters flying overhead. So so it feels a little premature to me, but I I can understand. I mean, it is a legitimate a future um, arena of the military, and I can imagine in the future it's going to become more and more important, and eventually it's going to um, require a division of the military on its own. And it's just a matter of time was when somebody decides that now is the time to separate out to a new branch of the military and call it Space Force, and whether it's today or whether it's in 50 years, it will eventually happen. So um, now, uh, so, so let's see. So go ahead. Let's, let's talk about this some more. So Force Awoken says, won't it cost a ridiculous amount to run? Uh, not really, right? I mean, I think what you're going to do is you're going to take all of the parts of the Air Force that currently handle military, uh, co deal with space, and you're going to separate them out into their own separate group and have someone is in command of them. And so they're going to handle reconnaissance and they're going to handle uh, GPS systems and, and logistics and, uh, you know, those kinds of technologies. And then as the as more and more hardware is brought to bear, then they're going to handle more. So really what it's going to do is it's going to take away from the budget of the Air Force, which, you know, and they have they've already got they have their own launch pad at um, uh, at Cape Canaveral and their own hangar where they build up their rockets and then, you know, they sort of move them out along a railway to the launch facility and then they, you know, they've launched them from there. So all of those kinds of facilities, will have, yes, it will no longer be called U.S. Air Force. It'll be called U.S. Space Force. So I don't really see that it's a gigantic budget distraction. It's just another name, another group. And so the people who had power over that section are no longer going to have power over that section and they're going to be grumpy about it. But somebody else is now going to have a you know, is going to get a new part of the military that they're going to be able to control. But well, I don't think it really matters that much. Like, really, it's just a name. And so I don't see it's a big deal. Uh, you know, there is no need for the militarization of space unless somebody else goes and does the militarization of space. So if the Chinese do go and break the Outer Space Treaty and put nuclear weapons onto the moon or into orbit, then there's going to be a problem. So, uh, but for now, it doesn't really seem like it's that much of a, a big difference from what it already exists. And that's why I thought it was trolling it. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, so Frank Tippett is also mentioning Vandenberg, right? So out on the West Coast, there is the Vandenberg Air Force Base, which launches both uh, military Air Force uh, rockets, but also civilian rockets and stuff for NASA. So um, it just doesn't feel like it's that uh, that different. Uh, Mike Locke, have you ever thought of running for office? We need a scientist in office. No, thank you. Um, one, I'm Canadian, A. Eh? So, you know, I could run for Canadian office, which uh, we've already got, uh, a, you know, a... <laughs> I'm trying to think, how do I describe <laughs> We have a controversial prime minister here, um, if you ask any Canadians. So, uh, but no, I don't want that job. I'm happy. I get to talk about space. I get to uh, write. I get to make videos. I get to hang out with you people. That's what I want to do. And uh, I even, I used to run software companies and I didn't want to do that anymore, even though it paid better. So let's see. Um, any other questions? Man, there's a lot of questions here. All right. So Marv, you know, watch this. What's your favorite upcoming telescope, not counting the homie webs? So I just did a video about sort of the four mega telescopes that NASA is considering after uh, James Webb and W first. And the so they're the the Louvoir telescope. They're the um, HabEx, the Lynx and the Origin Space Telescope. And Obviously, I want that the Louvoir, right? I want the 15 to 20 billion dollar telescope that's going to be 15 to 18 meters across, 
you know, 50% to twice as large as any telescope that's ever built on ground, but it'll be in space, right? In space. Uh, that's what I want, please. Yes, it'll be in optical, infrared, ultraviolet. Uh, yeah, no, that's the one I want. But I don't think we'll get that one. And so if I had to make a sort of a second choice, I would choose the Habex, which is the Habitable Worlds Exo, Habitable Exoplanets Finder. Anyway, you know, it's going to have the ability with two kinds of coronagraphs to see habitable worlds around other star systems, which is like the holy grail, right? It's the most important question that human beings can ask, which is, are we alone in the universe? Is there life anywhere out there around any other star system? And the that's the machine that would do it. Although Luvar would also do it, you know, in its sleep. So, so either of those would be great. But that's the question. Like if I, that's the scientific question I want answered. But the scientists are coming together for the decadal survey. And I'm really looking forward to covering this decadal survey as the various groups and committees come together. It's a, it's a very fascinating process. You know, Dr. Pamela Gay, my co-host on Astronomy Cast, she's been involved in the, in the process in the past. And, you know, we did a show like 10 years ago where we talked about the last decadal survey. And I would love to sort of see the pieces coming together. I see it as like some kind of sports ball, you know, uh, division thing, you know, like a like a bunch of uh, StarCraft tournaments coming together. So uh, Bill Sugden, any chance for Louvoir as a multinational project? Maybe, uh, you know, these the, uh, either you have, I mean, the various space agencies, the various nations do coordinate and they try to sort of, you know, if one nation is going to answer a question about, say, x-rays, another nation will try to answer questions about gravitational waves. And you, so you see ESA and NASA really sort of taking those steps together. Uh, and But then you can also see various nations contributing science instruments or helping with the building of various parts. So the Canadians, uh, we had a a portion of the W first telescope, but apparently we just pulled out of that. So, you know, that's a bad example. Um, the Americans, uh, NASA is providing one instrument on a Korean satellite that's coming up and that that one instrument is going to be able to find uh, ice in the permanently shadowed craters on Mars or sorry, on the moon. So it's a great sort of, it's great to see. And you think about the Cassini Huygens, right? You had the Cassini spacecraft built by NASA, but then you had the Huygens mission, which was provided by the European Space Agency. And so these missions work together all the time. And it, and the International Space Station is, of course, the greatest example of that, where many nations came together to build something that no one nation could do. Um, thanks, Nightbot. Nightbot is noting the question mark is, uh, is helpful. Uh, and on, how often do you get called Fraser Crane? Fraser Crane, about once a day in the in the in the YouTube comments, maybe once every two days. So, uh, and I always make the same joke every time, which is that I had the name first. And if you do the math, right? I was born in 1971. The show Cheers was the early 80s. I had the name first, uh, and then some person at some show came up with the name and it stuck and i even have sent a tweet to kelsey gramer asking if i could have the name back and uh he didn't reply so for now i guess we have to share custody of the name but i had it first and what's hilarious is uh about a year ago i was uh, talking to someone and they mentioned i said you know my name is fraser kane and, and then they didn't giggle and I'm like, you know, it's like the show, you know, and she was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I have my name first. So it's my name is coming back to me now. And even now, right? You watch Cheers, you watch the Fraser show and you see Dr. Fraser Kane, even though I don't have a doctorate. And I have the better haircut. I think our haircuts are starting to get closer and closer to the same thing. Of course, you always know when I've got this haircut, that means we just shot some new episodes of the of the Guide to Space. When it gets a little longer, that's when it's been a while since I've shot a new video. So we just shot uh, a video all about in situ resource utilization, which is living off the land in space, which was a vote from the, uh, I put it to a vote on the community tab and that was the one you all wanted first. So I did it because I live only to serve. 
All right, Commander Salandermanders, do you think the BFR will be ready by 2024? Um, uh, no. Um, maybe? Who knows? I mean, this is, we're living on Musk time, right? Um, the Falcon Heavy arrived many, many years late. Uh, so, but the Falcon Heavy arrived and it worked mostly, except for the center core, but it launched and the two side uh, boosters landed and then the central core smashed into the ocean, but, but it mostly worked and it's going to happen again. And this time it'll probably work. So, so I never believe in SpaceX's timelines. They said they were going to send humans on a translunar orbit. And that looks like it's been pushed back because it turns out sending humans beyond the orbit of the moon is hard, right? But I love the fact that Musk and SpaceX just plants the flag and says, we're going to do this. And if it takes longer, they just get embarrassed and they don't care. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's the best. And so I don't think that the, the BFR is going to fully be operational by 2024. But right now, the plans are the the top portion is going to start doing some jump tests next year, 2019. And then it's going to do um, more like orbital tests by 2020. And then we could see the, see the full stack starting to do some tests. So, so who knows what's going to happen? All right, George has uh, given me a question. Uh, when will we send a robotic probe to Mars that will actually be designed to detect life? Don't know. Um, the the closest that we have right now is, of course, well, the, the Viking landers were sent back in the 1970s to with the instruments on board to detect life. And the problem is that they did or they didn't. And uh, astrobiologists are still arguing to this day whether or not the Viking landers actually found life on Mars. Uh, you know, they don't know. The experiment was inconclusive. And so uh, NASA learned a really powerful lesson from, from that inconclusive response. And so they've been coming at it again, but this time they're building up the evidence very, very carefully. So the Spirit and Opportunity were there to find out if there was ever water on the surface of Mars. Curiosity is there to see if water has been on the surface of Mars for a long time, right? And the, the, the next one, the Mars 2020 rover, is going to go to Mars, and it's going to see if the conditions for life were, were good for life, and if there are the kinds of elements that were contained within life on Mars. So it's still not looking for life, but it's going to sort of be one step removed for looking for life. But what also um, the Mars 2020 rover is going to do is it's going to do sample collection. So it's going to be driving across the surface of, of Mars. It's going to be picking up what are interesting samples, dropping them on, you know, on the surface. And then later on, a sample return mission is going to come along, pick them up and return them to Earth. And then astrobiologists back on Earth are going to examine them for life. So that's that's when it's planned to happen. But any time if, um, you know, if the Mars 2020 rover or if Curiosity or even Opportunity sees something interesting like a fossil or something like that, then they would absolutely talk about it. Let's see. Mr. Tommy Pickles, how do you picture the concept of space mining playing out over the next few decades or longer? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I think you're going to see space mining pan out a lot quicker than I think anybody had imagined. You know, of course, we've been waiting a long, long time for space mining to uh, to happen, well, for anything outside of low Earth orbit to happen. But there's two really interesting companies, and actually this is in the next video that, that we're working on right now. One is called Planetary Resources, and the other one is called uh, Deep Space Industries. And both of them, like Planetary Resources, has launched a CubeSat whose job it is to identify potential asteroid targets. And Deep Space Industries is probably going to launch theirs by 2020. And both are going to be sending out robotic spacecraft to asteroids to prospect, to look for potential uh, targets and, and minerals and stuff on the, you know, water and stuff on their surfaces. And so I think we're going to see, you know, some, some 
robotic spacecraft sent to asteroids within the next, you know, it's going to take it's going to take longer than you think. So it's probably going to take maybe by 2024. Uh, and then we will probably see some interesting missions trying to actually acquire resources from the surface of those asteroids by the end of the 2020s, I would think. So, but the potential for this is massive, right? Uh, that there, and I've, I read this somewhere that there's like enough minerals to make every person on earth a multi multi-millionaire right that you built up build up a good enough space-based resource acquisition mining whatever and we'll all be multi-millionaires because there'll be so much material that's going to be coming back to earth orbit let's do another question <laughs> larry beckman we bland flat earthers without remorse without mercy it's true they're just trolling. You don't feed trolls. All right. So Crushnot asks, I like the philosophical questions. This is great. A crazy biologist approaches you with a bacteria that can thrive on Mars. And you have the final say on whether we see this life on Mars with our current understanding of life on Mars. Do you send it? All right. So I've got some news for you. Uh, this already exists. So there are methanogen bacteria here on Earth that can survive and thrive on on Mars. So we already have have these microbes and it's possible we've already sent them. So, you know, just think about that and then know that I don't think it's a good idea. Right. I. <clears throat> all right. So like I know that the that people want to live on Mars and they want to go and they want to travel to Mars and they want to set up shop and they want to eke out a existence on the red planet. And I understand that it's sort of the next place and it creates a backup of Earth. And there's all these good reasons why you would want to go to Mars and why Mars instead of the moon. Like there's all kinds of like I understand the arguments, but we don't know if there's life on Mars right now that we have not done a comprehensive check for Mars. And we've learned here on Earth that invasive species suck. And I'm still digging out various invasive species out of my backyard um, from, you know, like plants that come from Europe and, and so on and so forth, right? So we're going to do that to Mars. And so the question is, do we want to accelerate that process or do we want to just try and do a good exploration of Mars and try to find out if there is life there and if there ever was life there. And we have to do that without disturbing it with our own Earth life. And I think that space itself, asteroids, just the just getting out into space and being able to live out in space on its own is enough of a challenge. Um, so personally, I would wait on Mars and really try to make it a very you know, uncontaminated world until we've done a really good analysis of the planet. And we know with a lot of certainty that um, that we know that there's that there's no life there. And then if we do find that out, then goodbye, Mars, right? Like, let's just grind it up, do whatever we want. I don't care, right? Just, you know, build build on the surface, dig underneath, tear up its mountains, turn them into minerals, fire them into space, turn them into bricks doesn't matter right at this point, unless you like the shape of the, the mountains, but, but, but we shouldn't wreck the life, infect the life with earth life until we have a really good sense. And I think that just takes time and caution and patience. And so when you see rockets going to Mars in the next decade, filled with human beings, filthy human beings, then, then you know that that, uh, that there's no chance, there's no chance we're going to stop this, we are going to infect Mars and sorry, Mars, it's just going to happen. Uh, A.B. Scott and Flower says, but Fraser sending 100% sterile robots is impossible. Yeah, it is impossible, but you can try really hard. And in fact, there's been some new techniques to further sterilize, sterilize spacecraft that seems to be panning out. I think people could, you know, if we're really careful, they could sterilize them. Um, significantly and then try to keep them away from places on Mars where the life could get a foothold, but it's still a risk. So that is my, that's my feeling. And I know I'm completely against the grain. C Cody is kicking around here and he will gladly step on my, you know, body to climb over and get to the surface of Mars. And, uh, I love that guy. So, you know, 
we, we just keep having arguments about it for now. In fact, Sergio Botero says, infect Mars with our awesomeness. So, there you go. Mars could use some more awesomeness from Earth. Uh, let's see. Let's, <laughs> let's see some more questions. Anne on asks, what computer games do you like? What's your favorite? Do you play Minecraft? I don't play Minecraft anymore, but I went to the first Minecon with my children back when they did it. And I met Notch and all of our three accounts have little capes that we got because we went to the first Minecon. Uh, it was kind of boring. I didn't really like it very much. Um, what other games do I play? Uh, Man, I play a lot of space strategy related games. I'm playing Battletech. I play uh, Stellaris. I always confuse that with Stellarium. One is astronomy software and one is a, a game. I really like the Paradox games. So um, uh, Europa Universalis. Uh, I like RimWorld. Um, but I, you know what? I don't have a lot of time for games. This is the problem. You have a lot of fun with your regular job and you don't have time for really anything else. So I try to eke out. I, I play some games when I ride the exercise bike. Uh, what's, man, I forget the name of the games that I play. Star Traders right now, which is sort of a, a fun game. So I play that. Um, uh, but like an hour a day of video games is about as much as I get to play. Let's see. apologize let's see I wish there's a way I could like tag questions I'm sure there is right there's a way I can tag questions and then pin them so that I can get at them in a little while uh, I played Kerbal Space Pro Program obviously uh, and I've mentioned this many times that Kerbal has taught me more about um, flight mechanics orbital mechanics than all of my time being a space journalist like it, I didn't get these things into my brain until I played Kerbal and tried to launch rockets and tried to change their orbits and tried to land on the moon. Then you suddenly understand everything so much better. Streety McCarface, um, my favorite launch vehicle. Man, uh, past launch vehicle. I love the space shuttle and I know that's wrong. Right, like I know it is a, it it killed fourteen astronauts. It cost a fortune to launch. It could barely launch what a you know a much larger rocket could do at a fraction of the price. Uh, uh, but I just love it. It was like I I was at um I was a kid. I was uh, ten years old, and my father. Uh, was a big space exploration nerd. He'd watched the, the the moon landings. And so he got me to come and watch the first space shuttle launch in 1981. And I was completely hooked. It looks like a space plane. It's amazing. And uh, I really loved that rocket. And that was sort of for the duration of my reporting in, in space, right? From I started reporting in 1999. I went to uh 2000 and i guess what 2011 was the last one so for a big chunk of my career the space shuttle was the main vehicle that we were reporting on and now i love you know the new things that are coming up and i think the bfr is sci-fi christmas it launches it lands every part of it is reused it is it is the beginning it is like the that is the beginning of the beginning <laughs> or the end of the beginning of proper space exploration where you've got rockets the way science fiction always promised that they were gonna work. And so I think the BFR for future vehicles is the one that I'm most excited about. Um, Cause it just, it's just dead simple, right? It just, it makes its fuel out of the air. It can, the whole thing can launch, both parts of it can land, everything is reusable. And then from that point forward, there will be refinements to this technology and so i think the bfr has absolutely nailed it and i cannot wait to see that thing launch the falcon heavy was fine it was big it was great it mostly was reused but the bfr is going to be the one that really ushers us forward and the costs are ludicrous right 
that the, the how low the prices are going to be for the the costs on the on the BFR to launch things into space. It's going to launch things that just seemed ridiculous to launch in the past. Constellations of communication satellites, mining material, colonists filled with filthy human beings to go and infect Mars. So I, I can't wait uh, for the BFR to fly. That is the one that is just going to change everything. Or not, you know, or the, the new Glenn or whatever uh, Blue Origin comes up with. Um, so we talked about, so Leonardo, we talked about Space Force at the beginning. So uh, maybe when this video is over, you can go back to the beginning and listen to it. Um, Let's see. So Anon asked another question, which was, um, what was my background? So for anyone who doesn't know my background, I've kind of mentioned, there's a, there was a great podcast where I sort of went in for like an hour and talked about my podcast. And I apologize, I, I don't have the link handy. And then on Pamela's show, she interviewed me for about an hour as well. Um, so just the, the short version is I grew up on a small island off the west coast of Canada called Hornby Island, and my family still lives there. Um, I went to high school in Courtney, which is the town that I live in now. I went to university at the University of British Columbia for engineering. I did a year of that and then stopped doing that because I really wasn't cut out to be an engineer. Um, and so then I founded a software company called Absolute Software and we developed a piece of software called CompuTrace, which got computers back after they were stolen. Is, I'm giving you the really short version. And it's now a public company in, in Canada. And then I left that company and I joined a web development firm out of Vancouver called communicate.com and then it went public. Um, and then uh, while I was working at that firm, I wanted to learn more about doing um, sort of how to build websites. And so I picked one of my hobbies, which was space exploration. And I did that for like a couple of months and went, okay, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And that was about 20 years ago. So, and then other things have happened as well, but that's the short version of, of my, uh, of my life. Um, Larry Beckham is asking, are any thoughts on the Gateway Foundation and its lottery? No, I don't. I have not heard anything on this, so I will look into it. Maybe I'll have one of them as a, as a guest. I, they reached out to me at one point, so that should be, uh, Nancy. <laughs> um... Let's see. Necroticus, do you know if SpaceX has any plans to develop aerospace, aerospike technology? So I'm sure you saw Curious Droid's video on the, um, uh, on the aerospike, on the X-33 Venture Star. And this was, this was an attempt by NASA and, man, I forget which one, one of the aerospace firms, Boeing, I think, to build a single stage to orbit reusable spacecraft called the Venture Star, the X-33. And so the key to making that whole thing work was that it was going to use an aerospike engine, which is sort of an engine that can kind of change its shape as, you know, it's in different parts of the atmosphere and it's a very efficient way to, to operate. And in the end, because of the, the ceramic the, the sort of the ceramic materials, they had to cancel the X-33, although there was probably other reasons why they were going to cancel it as well. Um, but you know, and there's been lots of ideas about, you know, could we do a single stage to orbit spacecraft? And the really the thinking is right now with the fuels that are available right now, even if you could build a single stage to orbit, which which you can, I mean, you know, an Atlas rocket, I believe is single stage, you could take a whole Atlas, you could just launch the whole thing into space. Um, and there are others. And of course, the 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 spaceship portion of the BFR is going to be a single stage to orbit. But it's just like it, it just comes to economy, right? Now, even if you made the absolute perfect single stage to orbit, it could launch tiny little payloads into space because it's having to carry all of its fuel tanks and all of that material up into space then has to bring it all back down and get refueled while the bfr is sort of this perfect balance in between it like they've really i really feel like they've cracked the code right that you've got these two you know you've got this it's a it's a two-stage rocket and so the thing launches together and then one stage departs and comes back down to the earth and lands and now it doesn't have to carry that extra weight anymore. And then the top part goes to orbit. And that's going to give you maximum amount of cargo to space for the minimum amount of, of money and minimum amount of fuel. And that is the, 
the best way to go about it. Everything else, single stage, I think single stage is currently with the kinds of chemical rockets that we have today is just not the most efficient way to, to go about it. While in the future, uh, you know, maybe we're going to come up with metallic hydrogen or maybe we're going to come up with, um, you know, a fusion rockets and then everything's different. But until then, uh, A.V. Scott and Flower, uh, you're asking about paving, melting regolith. Uh, just wait for my next episode on mining, on paving, on. And the coolest one, actually, is this really cool. It's called Arcanaut. And it's made by Made in Space. And they're building this three-armed robot that extrudes space uh, structures and then attaches them together into space telescopes or satellites, space stations, things like that. So it sort of is both, man, I, I can't even describe it. It'd be gross if like it poops space structural elements and then builds them. So anyway, it's an awesome idea. So that's coming up shortly. Jameson, 1776, what do you think the purpose of the X-37B is? I don't know, but it's going to be part of Space Force, that's for sure. Uh, no, I've, I've sort of had my thinking about what the X-37B is. And so for anyone who doesn't know what that is, that is the Air Force's reusable space plane. And it's up in space right now. And what's it doing? I don't know. Nobody knows. Um, uh, and that's the point. It's classified. But what I think it's doing is it is a test bed for the Air Force to test out different kinds of hardware in space. So they may, say, fill its cargo bay with a bunch of experiments, a bunch of materials, a bunch of, say, CCD cameras and um, computer systems and and so on and then and then just take the whole payload up to space and then just try to operate it and see how it deals with being up in space for seven months eight months 15 months and then the great thing is it comes back to earth and then they can take it all apart and they can look and see how it survived and that's a thing that you can't do right like right now you launch a satellite to space with a new camera system and you don't know how it's doing how well it's handling the radiation and the vacuum and the heating and the cooling while with the um, with the X-37, they can bring it back down and then they can take a look and they can dismantle it and they can see how the, how the materials are handling it. So that's my guess, but I have no idea what it really does. But that feels to me like if I was running, if I had a space plane and I was trying to build classified satellites with advanced technologies, that's what I would use it for is to just test it out. Mr. Tommy Pickles, what do you think of the recent Expanse episodes? I loved it. That is all that no one else to say. I'm so glad The Expanse has been picked up for Amazon. Good job, Jeff Bezos. Uh, he announced it at, at a, that they were picking it up. So clearly he's a fan. So I, I couldn't be happier. And I am really enjoying the show this season. It's by far the best season. I think it's great. And my wife has read the books and she says it gets even crazier. So I can't wait. Uh, Diego Canelo asks, are there any, hey Diego, how's it going? Uh, are there any space and science programs in public broadcasters in Canada? Yes. So there is a great show on, there's two things. So on, on the radio, there's the show that we all grew up with here in Canada called Quirks and Quarks. And I know you're in Australia. And so on ABC, they have a, a similar show and they've actually done crossovers with Quirks and Quarks, which is our Canadian show. And Bob McDonald is the, is the host of Quirks and Quarks. And I've met him a couple of times. I've offered to be a takeover as a host anytime he doesn't want to, but apparently he's a, you know, he's carved from a, solid block of granite so uh, by that quirks and quarks is a radio show you can get it as a podcast i love it I'm not, it's possible it has influenced things that i've made maybe um so check that out uh on the tv of course we've got the nature of things which is this long-running tv documentary uh, i don't know sort of what's a similar it's kind of like nova but the canadian version of it and uh it's pretty good david suzuki is the host and again david if you ever want to step aside you want me to you know pitch in glad to do it anytime but david suzuki is 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 a treasure for canada so there you go 
and I like I watched the show as a child, <laughs> and he's still doing it. So, uh, Marcus G, what is my personal opinion of the ancient simulation paradox? I find the simulation so the ancient simula simulation paradox, right? This is that you know as our computers are getting more powerful, we are going to be able to simulate worlds, universes better and better and better. And eventually we'll be able to create a simulation where the people who are in the simulation have no idea that they're in a simulation. And then eventually we'll make a bunch of them and we'll make millions of them and billions of them. And so if the vast majority of existences of realities out there are simulated, then the chances that we're living in the real one is pretty remote. Uh, we're probably living in a simulation. You know, that's this is the conversation that's gotten Elon Musk kicked out of uh, hot tubs in the past. Uh, the math checks out, but there's no way to know for sure. So it just doesn't matter, right? Like, what can you do? You can't live your life any other way. Uh, whether, you know, is life predetermined or is, do we have choice? We have to just act as if we do. And we have to act like this is the only reality that we have. So I, I, the, I find the concept really fascinating. I love to think about that kind of thing, but at the same time, I, you know, un unless there's some way to actually find out, there's nothing we can really do about it. Questions. Tyler Morgan, Fraser, how likely do you think life is in the oceans of the Jupiter's moons? Now, you've probably seen that I've done a million episodes on searching for life on icy worlds. Um, uh, so yes, I think that there is the potential for life on Jupiter's moons. All of the pieces are there. There is water, there is um, dissolved hydrogen in the oceans on Jupiter, Jupiter's moons. There is, so there's fuel for bacteria. Everything seems to be there, but we don't have any concrete evidence. So we have to go and find out. Um, the, there's sort of like there's a lower density of, of sort of energy, of acquisition of energy on these moons. And so one of the thoughts is there could be life there, but it, there isn't like enough energy for it to really thrive and really build the kinds of multicellular species. Obviously, you know, we want the European space whales, but most likely if there is life on these worlds, it's never going to be more complicated than hardy bacteria huddled over the deep sea vents and that's probably all you're going to see and the thing is that we'll never be able to really find out unless we send a probe down through 10 kilometers of ice and and look underneath which i think we should totally do so um astro yyz fraser do you know if astro tours is planning something for either the 2019 or the 2020 total solar eclipse in south america yes um, that is the plan. So if you go to Astro Tours, which of course, this is the, the touring tours that I do with uh, Dr. Paul Matsetter and other people do them as well. We did Iceland back in February and that was amazing. Uh, we're doing a cruise in September and then we're going to be doing Costa Rica in March. And later on in 2018, early 2019, Paul is going to be leading a tour down to the Atacama Desert in Chile, which... I, is just a small group of people. I think it's like eight people. I think it's it's sold out, um, which would be amazing, right? You get to go see these big observatories down in Chile and and see the dark skies. But that's really a scouting run for us to figure out if we can do a more complicated tour to go see the the eclipse in Chile. So that is the plan, and we'll see if it all comes together. But the tours are fun. Uh, Federico. Guido Alvarez, sorry, <laughs> is dark matter just black holes? One of the theories for dark matter is that it is um, black holes, that it's something called uh, primordial black holes. And so these are tiny little black holes that are formed shortly, that were formed shortly after the Big Bang, sort of places where the density of the universe was high enough that, that, that black holes, you can imagine kind of like, you know, like in the early years, everything was so hot and dense. And but there were places of even, you know, some places that were higher density and places that were lower density. And you would get, 
you know, the density would be so high that you could get these little black holes and they would be left over. And there's no way to have black holes like that now. You've got to have a star and it's got to have all the pressures and so on to make one. But maybe there's some left over from the formation of the universe. And so this has been considered a theory to explain dark matter, but not many people, not many scientists really think it's that legitimate. Um, because one of the reasons you would see the you'd see these black holes evaporating. So uh, it's not closed completely, but I don't think a lot of astrophysicists think that it's legit or is a serious answer to what a black hole to to what dark matter is. Uh, Sasuli asks, what would be your dream telescope to own yourself or for personal use? That is a great question. And you're about to see me operating my dream telescope in a, like a couple of days. I hope, I hope, I hope. Uh, so our good friends at Oceanside Photo and Telescope have built a robotic observatory that we're going to be using to do some live telescope streaming. And they have built the telescope to my specifications, which is awesome. So it is going to be, I think it's 150 millimeter um, or 130 millimeter refractor. So it's very fast, but it's got a color camera on it. And so we've done some test runs with it and we can produce really cool photographs of objects, of deep space objects in about 30 seconds to a minute, which is unheard of. So we're going to uh, bring back the virtual star parties and use this telescope as the backbone. So that we've always got a telescope that's in dark skies, has good weather, it's in the deserts of California. So although we've had some like really high winds, we haven't been able to open up the telescope, but I've been testing it with Dustin from Oceanside over the last couple of weeks, and we're very close. And then when that is done, we'll do some test runs with this telescope. And then when that works, we will sort of bring the band back together and start doing some, some live stream shows so we can get some planetary stuff and some deep sky objects and the moon and the sun and, and bring on some astronomer experts and talk with you. So uh, it's happening. It's happening. I promise. I promise. It's soon. And that is my ideal telescope. I love refractors. They're my favorites. That's a refractor that I've got behind me. Um, and I really like them. You don't have to collimate them. You don't have to sort of adjust the mirrors. And they give a really nice view of the night sky. But they're not as good as um, for certain kinds of things than other things. So, you know, once you get in deep into the weeds, then you sort of have these kinds of preferences for telescopes. So, um, but yeah, do a search for Fraser Kane Virtual Star Party on um, on Google, on YouTube, and you'll see what we used to do. So, and you'll see a old, a young young Fraser, more hair. Uh, all right, uh, Larry Beckham asks, "What's the aperture on the telescope behind me?" It's a seventy millimeter, but it's an apochromatic refractor, so it's a really nice telescope. And if that was provided by Oceanside, so. Um, is my, Stephen Angus wants to know if my telescope is ultraviolet and infrared. No, it is only um, visible light. But actually, you know, it's everything. It all depends on the camera that you attach to it. So you can attach an infrared camera to a telescope like this, and then you can see infrared. But you have to keep the telescope cooler. So there are ground-based telescopes that are infrared. You kind of want to be in space if you're going to do ultraviolet. Uh, Mike Saller says, please comment on the prospect of someday building and launching a multi-stage rocket like the BFR from orbit. Wouldn't this vastly improve our reach into outer space? Uh, so the, uh, the next episode, I, you, it's like you people read my mind. Um, the next episode is all about building, uh, acquiring resources from space, building things in space. It's a fairly high level view of it but i think that the future is absolutely building things in space they're you know nasa is working with this company called made in space they're learning to print things in microgravity they're learning to uh construct things in space you're going to see the resources even if you just like f you know loft a, a bucket of titanium uh pellets and then you use that to, and then you construct your object in space. There are real benefits because your rocket doesn't have to go through the 
It doesn't have to start at Earth gravity. It can start from the gentle microgravity and then accelerate itself. So, so that is absolutely going to be the future. And then we bring our resources from asteroids and from the moon and from all these places. It's crazy to try to carry stuff from Earth gravity up into space. The future is absolutely everything to be manufactured in orbit. And then you bring stuff back to Earth that, to make your life better, like balls of platinum and gold and and stuff like that. So I can't wait for that for that future. But we have a long way to go before that all starts to happen. I'm sorry. Um, let's, let's see, Eric one, which is better for planet viewing reflector or refractor? Uh, I mean, both can do it. Um, most of the people who do the best planetary work that I've seen, they all use really big reflectors, right? Like a Newtonian reflector with a, like a really high F ratio, like F 40. So, or more. And, uh, and you kind of with anything, right? Once you start to specialize into a certain kind of object, you tend to build a telescope that is going to do exactly what you need it to do. And so these telescopes that they build are great for looking at planets and they're not good for looking at like anything else. So that's the way I'd go. Um, uh, and home to have a Wikipedia page about you. You need three plus independent, reliable sources about you. I think you might have that. Show me and I can make a sub. Uh, I used to have a, a Wikipedia page, but then a troll, um, did a constant battle over the course of many years. Like, look at Pamela's Wikipedia page and look at mine. Uh, we're both the co-hosts of Astronomy Cast, and it was sort of like an ongoing campaign. So you can go back through the history, and you can sort of see what happened. And now, if you search for me on Wikipedia, it just redirects to Universe Today, which has also been hacked down. And if you want to fix it, that would be great. At the same time, uh, I don't, I don't know. It's Wikipedia, right? Um, I don't even look at it. Uh, let's see. How would you mine? Who's one asked that? George Lancaster, how would you mine a pure metal asteroid? I don't know. Uh, you would have to heat it up with solar power, and then you would have to be able to um, melt the slag, or you'd have to melt the ore the rock that's containing the ore down and then you'd have to have some way to get the ore off and you have to do this all in zero gravity and you have to do this without uh, power lines and hydro plants you'd have to do this with solar power so it's a challenge um, that would be a, a real challenge to try and make that happen and these are the kinds of things that that people are going to be working on over the next time there are a million little details right to, to replicate the kinds of manufacturing um, uh, like the manufacturing chains that we have here on Earth, but to do that in space, you have to re-engineer everything that we do to exist in a place that is in a vacuum, that's in microgravity, that is has to handle incredible heat tolerances back and forth, where the only way you can get your energy is from solar panels and so on and so forth. So um, it's, it's going to be a big challenge, but it's going to keep us busy and entertained for hundreds of years. I'm looking forward to it. Each little, and you know, these are the things that I love. I love the incremental improvements that we make, the new discoveries, the new technologies that we figure out one after the other. And that's the part that I find, you know, if you read what kinds of stuff we're talking about on Universe Today, if you see the kinds of videos that I want to talk about, um, it's these incremental improvements. I don't want, you know, like Isaac does a great job of, of looking forward a quadrillion years to the far, far future of humanity. I'm interested in something that's going to happen in the next 10 years, the next 20 years. That's where I like to play. So, um, Abe's gotten flower. How come Elon never talks about rotating habitats and spacecraft? I don't know. Um, if you look at the BFR, he's talked about how you can have a lot of fun floating around inside the zero gravity as you go to Mars for the kinds of durations that they're looking for with the BFR, you know, fly to the moon, come back, fly to Mars. The, the times are short enough. We saw what happened with, with Scott Kelly, that you can go a year 
in microgravity and be able to handle it. So it's more like, are people going to be up there for months, years? And those are tests that need to happen. So uh, that's what you uh, are going to have to do. So I don't know why. I mean, it's just like, like Elon right now, I would assume, is only interested in how do we build a rocket that can launch a ludicrous amount of stuff off the Earth, take it to space, land it somewhere else, take off from there. What are you going to put inside of it? Details. Um, uh, and um, yeah, if you absolutely, if you want to fix and repair my Wikipedia page, that would be awesome. I would love that. I would be deeply in, in grateful for you to be able to fix that. That would be wonderful. Thank you. There, there's the answer. Um, let's see. More questions. And we're another like four minutes and then I'm going to wrap this up. Pip Lynch, what great space achievement do you wish or believe would happen in your lifetime? Uh, well, I, I, the biggest thing is that I want to see the, I want to see the discovery of life on some other world that isn't earth, right? It is the greatest question that human beings can answer. Are we alone in the universe? And the answer has both sort of a, is a science question. It's a sort of a very important, um, you know, philosophical question. Like, are we alone? Are we the first? Are we the only advanced civilization in the universe? Are we the only life form? Why did it happen here and it didn't happen somewhere else? I mean, it's a really important question. But then also, um, think about what the pressure is on us, right? What if we are the first? What if we are the only ones? Then it's our job to make sure that the candle of intelligence doesn't go out in the universe, right? What if we are the only intelligent life form in the entire observable universe? And if we mess this up, if we wreck our planet, if we bring on the robot apocalypse, if we um, if we create a virus that kills us all out, if we don't conquer space and we get wiped out by an asteroid, then that will have put out that candle, that one spark of knowledge here in, in the entire universe. And that would be a real shame. And so I think that we need to get to that answer. And then once we have that answer, then, then we need to do something important with that answer. So that's how I feel. Um, someone asked, how do you Kriloff asks, hello from your relative pass. As I had to pause the video, how do you make the time to have so many live streams? I, I, well, it's the trick is to not prepare. Right. So, um, and we, but, but we're in sort of a new era, which is the whole idea of the Twitch streams. Right. So you look at my friend Skylius over on Twitch and she will do a stream for nine straight hours and interact with people. Look at people like Ninja. So, um, there is some real value to doing this stuff live to being present and sort of letting the sort of full force of the questions that people want to know and just like sticking your face in the river of I, my analogy is falling apart here, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like there's real value. It, and so for me, as a person whose job it is to explain things, it sharpens my knowledge and my expertise to have to stay stand in front of you live for an hour and try not to make a fool of myself. And that makes me, I think, a better journalist, a better broadcaster, a better creator here on this platform. So it's possible that I'm in school right now and you're the ones teaching me. Um, and so I think that's really valuable. And I think that, that when I look at the patrons, right, the people who pay me on a regular basis, uh, to be able to have a career that I do where I talk about space and I get to talk to astronauts and I get to use telescopes and all that kind of stuff. The least that I can do is be present and, and participate in the conversations that I am sort of helping to shepherd over. So, uh, you find the time, you know, what's an hour? It's an hour is like I could play some video games or I could hang out with you guys for an hour. So 
All right, I'm going to wrap things up. It's uh, It's been an hour. That was super fun, and I always enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy the sort of the solo live stream, and I also enjoy when I have the guests. I've got some really interesting guests who I've been talking to. So if you uh, – but uh, I talked to David Brin. He may come on. I talked to um, – uh, Paul Glister from Centauri Dreams, he's going to do it. Uh, so some other really cool people. And the other thing is that if you haven't already joined the WSH crew, and they will teach you how to help organize guests for this and the Weekly Space Hangout and all the other stuff that we do. So um, I don't have time to be everywhere. And so if there are guests that you want me to talk to, I'm glad to talk to them. Uh, but you're going to need to do some work first, and that is that you're going to have to pretend you're an executive producer of my show and invite one of these people to do the work, to come and show up and, and do the interview with me. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. We will see you all uh, next up. Uh, it's probably going to be the question show because the in-situ one is taking a little more time. Uh, we've got the Weekly Space Hangout on Wednesday and Astronomy Cast on Friday. So I'll see you all next time.